So I dropped the business and uh, things uh, pretty quickly fell apart from there. I realized I was spending most of the money that I was making running this laptop business, which was about a thousand dollars a week. And, you know, when you're a student, like that's a ton of money. And this was also like seven or eight years ago. So I was spending a ton of money, uh, on just stupid things, uh, cars and clothes and food and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so my, my fall from grace was, was fast and complete. Well, you know what they say, that you need to have a failed business behind you in order to create a successful one. And certainly Josh went through a bad patch, and you know, like all of us do, if we want to start a business. And you really definitely need to hear the whole story to get a good sense of where he is today. And it's pretty interesting how he managed to get inspired and change things around. So enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Josh. How are you today? I'm doing super well. I've had a, an excellent week, so I'm feeling good. Oh, brilliant. That is good to hear. And that's always starting off on a positive footing. So uh, I'm pleased to hear that. You're in the USA, San Francisco area? Yep, San Francisco. Our office is in Oakland, just across the bay from it. Brilliant. And I'm in the UK, so we're on a massive time difference of eight hours. Um, so I'm really happy and, and, and delighted, actually, to hear your story and um, get into that. So the first question I ask every single guest, and that is for them to literally take us back to the beginning. So a little bit about your personal life. Where were you born? Where have you moved around, if anywhere? Where did you go to school? What did you study? Um, you can share a bit about your family, your hobbies and interests. You don't have to. Um, and then we'll move on from there and we'll get into the kind of work bit after that. So over to you, Josh. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So I was born in a town called Turlock, California, which people think of California, especially every time I visit the U UK, they're like, oh, California, it's amazing. And I do live in San Francisco now, but where I grew up was... I literally grew up on what used to be an almond orchard and my friends lived on a dairy farm and my other friend lived in a cornfield. So it was, it was in gorgeous. the farming. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was very gorgeous and it was, it was, it was awesome, but it was a farming community. It was mm. very, very old school, very, it was a small town, maybe about 60,000 people, but very spread out. So people lived 10, 15 miles apart and, you know, people weren't, weren't close by all the time. And I was homeschooled. So I spent a ton of time outside in those cornfields and playing in the mud and Brilliant. digging holes and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I have six siblings, so <gasps> spent a lot of time with the the siblings just hanging out. And uh, my, my two best friends growing up were also homeschooled. So we spent just a ton of time outside and having fun and riding bikes and climbing trees and building things and <gasps> getting into trouble and all that kind of stuff. So I am so jealous, Josh. <laughs> That's just <laughs> incredible. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty amazing and I'm very grateful for that opportunity that I had just to to spend so much time learning how to enjoy myself and and to entertain myself. You know, we'd spend hours and hours, like full days just outside and you know our our whole Man. thing was like we were either we were either going up or we were going down, so we would build these giant tree houses and then we would also dig these huge networks of like underground tunnel bunkers with like whole rooms underground. And <laughs> it was the coolest thing just to be able to to do that. And since we were homeschooled, oftentimes I'd be done with my week's worth of school by Wednesday morning. And then like the rest of Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we'd literally just be outside 
having fun and, and, uh, building things and riding bikes and hurting ourselves, trying to go off ramps and all that kind of stuff. So that was, uh, pretty much the way that I grew up. And, which, uh, which, and to what age was that? I was homeschooled until high school, so until the age of fourteen. So, um, oh, man, you ha- you have no much- idea how long a life you're going to live as a result of that. It's 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 pretty awesome to to have that background. Is <laughs> yeah. I you know I talked to talk to a lot of my friends now that you know grew up in other areas and their childhoods were vastly different. You know, mm. it's TV and video games and you know, late nights with Mountain Dew. And, you know, I, I enjoy those things as well, but I have mm. such a different upbringing in that a lot of, a lot of my time when I was growing up was spent being creative in mm. just what I was doing. Like there was creativity was part of everything because if you weren't, then you were just standing outside super bored. So uh, you really had to to kind of figure out your own way in terms of just what you're doing with your time. Mm. And uh, that that's carried through in pretty much everything I've done since then. So, But, you um, know, I mean, you could literally go around the country and talking to people <laughs> about your upbringing and homeschooling. And because actually that's where people need to go back to, quite honestly, you know. The, the schooling systems are broken around the world anywhere anyway and although there's one school in india that i know of that is working but everywhere else that they're, they're broken i mean kids do not want to be in schools right yeah i think i think especially in america there's there's a broken education system and mm. my mom and my sister are both public school teachers now and wow. they're doing such amazing work actually caring and actually giving those students the type of education where you do learn to think creatively, you do learn how to do public speaking, you do learn all these skills that are typically not taught in school because, you know, they're following a curriculum that's not very up to date, really, and a lot of things are missed. So I think the problem is in we're just not investing in the youth, we're not investing in education the system, yeah, it's broken everywhere. Um, but people coming in and doing the right thing, like my mom and my sister are doing, is the way that we slowly fix that. It's almost like the, you know, the health food movement here in the Bay Area. Now, now everything's organic. Everything is, you know, locally farmed. That kind of stuff. And that happened because people started buying those products that were locally sourced and organic and non-GMO and all that kind of stuff. Yes. It wasn't because corporations decided to do it. No. So I think it's the same type of thing with education. Like people need to individually step up and say, I'm not going to stand for this. We're going to do this differently. And then eventually the the systems will reshuffle and get in line. Mm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Like an underground movement almost. Like yeah. People I mean, power. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it really is. I mean, the the power of of people making small individual changes is is huge, um, and that's that's a principle that is true of of really anything in business or in education or in life in general or in political movements, any of that kind of stuff. It's really just people making a stand on their own and then banding together to make this movement, and that's how change happens. Okay. Yeah. Great. So, so through to the age of fourteen, homeschooled, being on a farm. Did you have to work on the farm? So, it, by the time we lived there, it had been turned into houses, but the trees were still in the backyard. So, right. we had like sixteen trees in our backyard, uh, but we lived in a house. So it was kind of this weird thing where like the farm had been divided into houses. So yes. it was like a it was a neighborhood at that point, but. It was still on a farm. So I ended up not working on that farm, but I did work on a in a chicken ranch and on an almond orchard and in a cornfield and in a peach field uh, <laughs> as some of my first jobs. So this was really early on, like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Yeah. I was out in the fields digging trenches, you know, putting in sprinkler systems, cutting grass, uh, 
you know, <laughs> taking like food to the baby chicks, that kind of stuff. Oh, so man. really, uh, grueling work. It gets about 110 degrees in the summer. Yeah, sure. Uh, right? Um, and so just really, really hot. And that was my first real taste of work was working in fields. And then I had another job where I was delivering phone books, uh, which basically involved waking up at two 30 in the morning and carrying stacks of phone books and placing them on people's front porches. So you'd, you couldn't throw them cause it was two 30 in the morning. So you'd have to carry yes. stacks of these books down the street walk up to each driveway and place a book. So my first taste of work was about as difficult as you can get, like either working in a field or carrying heavy books to, uh, lay, lay, uh, lay them onto people's porches. So that was, that was how I first got started working. But I did, I did love the idea of that kind of productivity of getting stuff done and yes. being able to see the results of your work as well. So that was how I got started. Um, and then, so that was like beginning of high school, junior high, that kind of thing. Yes. And then I started public school in high school, played sports a lot for a couple of years and kind of stopped doing any sort of work during that time. Um, and just really enjoyed work and and learned how to be on a team. Really, uh, I had always played sports um, since I was I started playing soccer, well, football, uh, when I was <laughs> four years old, and uh, played sports my entire childhood up until high school. But got really into it in high school, so I played every sport I could. Yes, uh, the first couple of years, but then. After my second year of high school, my family ran into some financial hardship and we really had no money for anything um, and not even not even really to support me playing sports and buying the equipment, any of that kind of stuff. So yes. I either had to go get a job or, well, I really had to just start making money some way or another. Um, so I tried to get a job. Uh, this was when I was 16 years old, which is the first legal working age uh, in uh, California. So mm. I went around and I applied to McDonald's and Burger King and Subway and all the places where you know you would think to get your first job. But it was right in the middle of the financial recession in 2008. And I could not get a job for the life of me. Like I couldn't get anything. Like I couldn't get the most basic mundane washing dishes job like wow. i didn't even get didn't even get an interview at any of these places mm. which is the craziest thing and you know i've always been one to go a bit overboard so i applied to like 60 places and heard back from absolutely zero of them mm. and so then i was kind of stuck i was like well i have to make money like i, I literally can't live without it um at this point i was like even buying my own food, um, at, at 16. So I had to do something. And so what I ended up doing was taking the skills that I had. So working on a farm, I had learned how to do a lot of like irrigation stuff yes. and also like, uh, how to maintain grass and install it and like manicure lawns and that kind of stuff. So me and my best friend, made these flyers about our services and it said something along the lines of, uh, you don't want to work on your yard cause it sucks. So let us do it. <laughs> and we, uh, we put them all around, we put them up on Craigslist and we got some hits. And so I started just undercutting the prices of anybody else, like massively. So we would charge maybe a third as much as anybody else would to yes. do lawn maintenance. And then before long, we got our first job actually installing a lawn. So laying out the sod, the actual grass and yes. putting in this, the irrigation, the sprinkler system. Um, you know, we made a thousand dollars working for about uh, 12 hours a day for a week, moving probably 10 tons of sand. That was our first real big job. Yeah. Uh, but so it, it worked out to be a, a terrible wage. But it was incredible to be at the end of the week and, and have this entire new lawn and sprinkler system installed and 
you know, get a check for a thousand dollars, or at that time it was mostly paid in cash. So mm. it's just you get a thousand dollars, and that's a huge amount of money to a sixteen-year-old who you know was just denied from all these jobs that pay. Yes. At that time it was six six twenty-five an hour was minimum wage. So that's right. It was it was it was pretty amazing, and that was my first time being a, a true entrepreneur mm. and I was 16 and a half and now I'm 25, just about to turn 26 and I have done nothing but being an entrepreneur since then. So that wow. is out of it. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, from how long were you doing the kind of maintenance and laying lawns business and how long did that go on for? Yeah, so that went on for not too long, uh, probably nine or ten months. Um, but like I said, I'm never one to hold back. So we probably did about ten really big jobs in that time. And I was I was a full time student at this time as well. So yes. I had to go to school every day. Uh, and so these were like weekends and that kind of stuff. So we did ten of these like pretty big jobs. I uh, made some good money. I bought my first truck off of that money, uh, which I was very proud of. Yeah, I uh, put it a video of it up on the internet, which now I get made fun of for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was, I was, I was, you know, very proud of that, but I actually ended up pulling a disc in my back when I was 17 because, uh, these, these rolls of grass weigh about 50 pounds yes. and of course I didn't have money to buy any equipment. So I was carrying them by hand and we were also digging a lot of trenches. So constantly, you know, bending my back and not paying attention to, you know, ergonomics or being safe. So pulled my back and, uh, couldn't do anything. I ended up stopping playing sports. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't really move, uh, well enough to do the jobs either. So, uh, then I kind of got lucky because, uh, part of, part of what I would spend my money on was buying speaker systems. And I had a speaker system in my truck that, mm -hmm. I wanted to upgrade, so I went on Craigslist and, and listed the old one for sale, and somebody responded and said, hey, uh, I don't want to buy it, but I'll trade you my laptop for your speaker system, and I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. I don't really know much about that, but um, mm -hmm. let's let's like meet up and I'll like check it out. So I met up and I ended up trading the guy. Um, the speaker system was only worth about $100, and I didn't really know too well what the laptop was worth, but we just did the trade. And then I went home and I Googled what the laptop was worth and it was worth about $400. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, I should just sell this. Yes. I'm going to make $300. So <laughs> I ended up selling it for like $300, I think, but I made $200 doing nothing. And I was like, I just literally broke my back trying to make like $200 in like a whole week yes. moving sand. Yeah. And then I also made two hundred dollars. Like literally just obviously I had to like reformat the computer and make sure it was like set to factory settings and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I made two hundred dollars doing that. That's ridiculous. So then I realized that you could do this. Like people have old computers that maybe they have problems or viruses and stuff like that. Um and so I just started scouring Craigslist to find people that had these, that 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 had some sort of problem that was fixable. And yeah. then I taught myself how to fix computers. I spent like literally weeks locked in my room figuring out how to fix computers. Uh, and I would go out and I'd buy one. I'd fix it. I'd set it all up. And so it was running properly. And I'd resell it. And the average margin was upwards of $100. And then I repeated that process about 500 times over the next two and a half years. So my last two years of high school and my first year of college, uh, buying and selling computers that had problems, um, fixing them along the way and mm. then reselling them mm. to somebody that needed a good used laptop. Um, and so that was my, my second business was, you know, pure happenstance, uh, to make that trade once. And then, realizing there was an opportunity, learning literally everything I could about computers, um, and then fixing a whole bunch and uh, buying and selling them. And that one that one did quite well. Uh, the, the margins were amazing. I ended up 
Mercedes coupe when I was 17 and a half and drove it to my high school graduation <laughs> and, and was like on top of the world. Like this is the coolest thing ever. Like I went from not being able to get a job at McDonald's to driving this like crazy fancy car in like two years. So it was, it was pretty cool. Wow. That must've felt good to have made, you know, that, I mean, I think your upbringing and your kind of hard work, w literally working the fields, um, set you up for continuing that ethos of hard work and then applying that on something totally different, which is computers. Yeah. I mean, it's all the same. Like mm. you have different skills, but the actual thing that matters is the drive that's behind it yes. and you know I've run four different businesses really and all four are completely different and the only real thing that's the same is just that drive to not only work hard which you know is learned in the fields but be creative which was learned in those long hot summer days of having nothing to do and you know, not even like we'd never had TV. So there was no other options. Like there was literally nothing to do unless you thought outside the box and created your own fun. And so I think those two things combined are really what, you know, gives that backbone of, you know, let's get the hard work done and let's think outside the box to create solutions to whatever problems coming up. Yeah. And that's, that's been huge. Wow. Okay, so computer business up and running, you then decided to do something different. Yeah, so computer business was really in the full swing in high school. Like I had other people working for me and I was getting margins from them. It was like this whole crazy thing. Um, but then I moved from my small town to Los Angeles because I got into UCLA and moved away for the first time, left my hometown for the first time. Mm -hmm. I had never, the furthest I had been before that was like Nebraska, which is not much different from where I grew up. I had never been out of the country, never been anywhere really. Um, so I left home to go to UCLA and my first quarter, so like my first semester of college, I basically failed out of school. I had graduated second in my class in high school and never really had to work that hard because it was just a, a small town where the education wasn't super difficult. Um, and so I, I didn't have to go to school a whole lot in high school. I missed like a third of the days my last year to run the business and I was still fine. Um, I tried to do the same thing at UCLA, but that's a world-class economic institution. And so they put me on my place and I failed all my classes in my first quarter and I uh, dropped the business because it was either keep the business going or actually care about school. Sure. And so I dropped the business and uh, things uh, pretty quickly fell apart from there. I realized I was spending most of the money that I was making running this laptop business, which was about a thousand dollars a week. And you know, when you're a student, like that's a ton of money. And this was also like seven or eight years ago. So I was spending a ton of money, uh, on just stupid things, uh, mm. cars and clothes and food and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, and so my my fall from grace was was fast and complete uh, after about a year of not running any sort of company. And at that point, I did get a regular job. I worked in a like a computer center on campus. Um, I went from the uh, the Mercedes Coupe to driving a 1988 Toyota Celica that broke down in La Brea right next to the tar pits, which was ironic. Um, and, the, you know, I ended up having a couple couple summers spend on friends' couches, uh, barely able to, to make rent, anything like that. Um, yeah. And it was, yeah. And, and out of that, 
what I ended up doing was uh, forming a small web development agency with uh, one of my good friends at that time, who's now my co-founder of my company, uh, and another friend of ours. And so we started selling web design projects because um, I was really into learning how that worked. I really wanted to get in technology. I knew that you know hardware was kind of dying away, and if I wanted to keep going, I needed to figure out software. Um, so we started that company, but it takes a lot longer to learn technology than it does to learn how to install a lawn or how to fix a computer. Yes. And so I'm here, like middle of college, like dead broke, like lost all this stuff that I had gained in those few years of like the early successes, trying to learn how any of this stuff works, how to do marketing to get clients how to like build websites how to like make all this stuff work so spending really long hours on all this stuff and at the same time just like you know super broke like really no no none of that awesome uh, kind of glory stuff that i had had uh before so um yeah that's that's kind of what what was going on during college mm. um but we did, you know, succeed with getting clients. So, um, it, you know, like I said, anytime I do something, I kind of go overboard on it. Yes. Um, so we ended up actually doing, doing pretty well. And it was funny because like I had no car, so I would ride my longboard to go visit clients. Like we had clients in Brentwood, which is, you know, a really richy, ritzy part of LA. Um, so I'd ride my longboard under the freeway about two miles to go visit our clients. I'd, I'd hide the I'd hide the longboard in the bushes so that they didn't see. It. I came on it and then like walk around so I'd stop sweating and then walk in and and uh, talk to these clients who were paying us like thousands of dollars to build their websites. Um, so made it work. It still wasn't enough money. I mean, we were three people, so thousands of dollars wasn't wasn't a whole lot. Um, especially I was paying my way through school as well. So yes, that, uh, didn't help. Um, so that was kind of the way it went is trying to learn how anything in the technology space worked, trying to get clients, trying to scrape by all of it, extremely difficult. Um, and in that time though, what ended up becoming really clear to us as we were working for all these clients is that the one thing that they actually cared about was their subscriber list. They cared about the contacts that they could market to in order to make sales. Oh, and, you know, regardless of what we were doing, if I came back to the client every two weeks and said, hey, your list has grown by 50 people, they were happy with us. They didn't care what else we did as long as that was happening. So that was one really interesting thing that became dead clear super early. And then the other interesting thing that happened was that one of our clients is this really is an older gentleman who does sales training, asked us to build him a quiz to get new contacts. He was like, I want you to build me a quiz that says, what's your sales personality? And in order for people to see their sales personality, they have to put in their email. And so we put it up on his site and it converted the traffic on his website into emails at a 50% ratio. So half of the people that came to his website put in their email. And the best we'd ever gotten on anybody else's website was 1%. So yes. one out of 100 versus 50. And we we're like, this is insane. Like, this is the craziest <laughs> thing that we've ever seen. Like, we, we've spent so much time on these other people's websites and it doesn't work. And then this stupid quiz <laughs> does work. Yes. And so, we, we couldn't look past it. It was too big of a deal mm. to not do something with. Um, and what what and timing we were, are we talking about now, Josh? When was this taking place? So now, now we're all the way in 2012. So right. gotcha. started college in 2010, kind of did the agency stuff for a couple of years. And then this is 2012. So you fell across this, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember one day me and the, the two guys in the agency were sitting in a hot tub and we were like, we should make a tool where people can create these quizzes. And I, I said, how do you even do that? I have no idea how you make a website 
where other people can make websites. Like that's crazy. Like, how does that, how does that work? Like, how do you store all that stuff? Yes. This is like literally what we're talking about is how do you store all that stuff? This is like where it came from. <laughs> the language the, even. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I love it. Matt, who's my co-founder, who's, you know, our lead engineer now, uh, was like, I don't know, maybe I'll try to figure out while I'm on vacation. So he like goes to Hawaii with his family and he's like, he messaged me one day. And he's like, dude, I think I figured out how to like store the stuff <laughs> in a PHP database. I'm, I'm going to try to learn it. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, so he gets back and he's like, yeah, I, th- I think I figured it out. Um, so we like put up this website where you can make quizzes. This is like summer 2013. Um, it has a terrible website. Uh, it was like the worst looking thing ever. Um, you can make a quiz on this website, but you can't save it. So people would like spend time making something and then you couldn't save it, mm. which was stupid. <laughs> uh, um, and like I started trying to sell it. Uh, I went on to Upwork, which used to be called something else. It's like the freelancer website. Yes. And I was like looking for people that wanted quizzes made. There was like two people. One of them actually paid us to make them a quiz. It was like 200 bucks. Uh, we couldn't actually do it on our platform. So we ended up doing it custom. It took like three weeks. Uh, so we made $200 in three weeks. <laughs> so the money thing was still not going super no. great. Um, and not to mention that we were now spending time working on this so we couldn't like work with our clients. So there's even less money. Um, and that, that, uh, didn't go well. Um, so first put that website up in 2013. Uh, and then the rest of 2013, through the beginning of 2014, we're trying to figure it out. Like, again, we went from a place where we were like, how do we store people's quizzes to trying to build this whole site where you could use a quiz to collect emails. Um, and then I was trying to figure out how in the heck you sell software. All I had ever sold before were computers on Craigslist and like can't sell software on Craigslist. It doesn't work. Uh, no. So this is where we're at and we're, we're like trying to work <laughs> with it um and i'm, I'm also, laughing i'm laughing with you josh i'm not laughing right. at you i think no, the journey you guys have gone on is just beautiful and actually it's endearing and it's actually really innocent and authentic you know that that you've literally taken one step and figured something out then you take the next step And this is really an important lesson because people that are trying to start their own business, they, I'm a bit like that. I want everything figured out at the start, you know, before I start things. So I have certainty. And actually, perhaps what you're describing, and you you will only know this when you're looking back, but the joy sometimes of having is having uncertainty, you know, on your journey. You don't know where you're going to get but you're just going to try it out or figure it out on the journey. So, so I'm, I'm honestly, I'm laughing with you, not laughing at you. It's, it's, it's a great story. Carry on. Yeah, no, it, I mean, it, it's a crazy, it's a crazy story and it is, <laughs> it is pretty funny looking back at it, but then you put yourself back in those shoes and like the, the, you know, the anxiety and the stress that sometimes comes with, sure. you know, or at that point in 2014 was when we were graduating college and we're like still trying to figure out how to build a website and nobody had paid for the software. And now we're going to be out on our own in the world, having to pay rent and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, what do we do? And it's funny because like a year about a year ago we were talking and we were just like when we were graduating college we never even considered getting jobs like that was probably really stupid we didn't have any income like what were we even thinking i remember we sat down at a a, a taco place and i was like uh, you know are you down to just like work on this after school and matt was like yeah for sure and that was the extent of it. Like, but that's how we decided that we were going to work on this, regardless of if it was making any money. Um, but we were getting towards the end of 2014. So it had been almost a year since we started working on this. And we finally got somebody to sign up and pay for the product because of some really unique content marketing we were doing around the idea of using quizzes for marketing 
we finally like gave up on all our sales initiatives and we're just like, we're just going to tell people how this works. Yes. And we put it up as blog posts and voila, like that worked. People started signing up because we were just explaining how it worked. Mm. Um, which was funny because in our minds it was dead simple, but we realized that we had been working on it every single day for a year and it wasn't simple. And if we would just explain it to other people, then they'd be down to sign up and try it. Um, and so that's how we ended up getting our first clients the beginning of or middle of 2014. Yes. And it was perfect timing because we graduated in June and then we moved to the Bay area, just kind of sight unseen and just started going for it. Um, and that was, that was the beginning of how the company started. But unlike my other companies where, you know, by six months in, I was making good amounts of cash. This one did not. So 2014 was our first paying client. We really struggled until 2017. So three years where it wasn't much different. It's mm. still no car, the dead minimum wage that we could live off of. Uh, we brought on one employee, um, tried bringing on others. It didn't work out, had mm -hmm. to let them go. Mm -hmm. So three full years of just a uh, slog, like trying to trying to figure it out, trying to make it work, um, never giving up, enjoying the process like you're kind of saying. But mm. at the same time, it was it was three years. And that was age 21 through age 24, which are like those years where you're kind of forming, you're trying to figure out who you are in the real world. And here we are seemingly banging our heads against the wall, mm. not really getting anywhere. Like three years in, we had... 200 paying clients who, you know, pay 40 bucks a month, something like that. Like just not enough to, to really get anywhere. Yes. Um, no, nothing significant. Um, and it was really tough. And especially with, you know, the background that I had where everybody knew I started a company when I was 16 and everybody knew that I had a, you know, a successful company in high school and all these expectations that get set uh, from a really young age. Now I'm sitting there at like 23, 24 with this company. That's like, mm, you know, just kind of waffling around, yes. not really going anywhere. So, um, that was, that was the reality of what the first four years of business were like was trying to learn how to do any of this stuff. Um, just barely, with enough revenue to get by. Like there were so many times where it was just like, <laughs> by some miracle, like, you know, some client paid us for a year and it just helped us hit our monthly expenses for that month. And that just like kept happening like every single month. And it just gets crazy stressful to be in that situation. Yes. Um, and did you feel at any stage through, through those years, those four years, I mean, to give it up? Did you guys go, right, this isn't working, this is not bringing in enough income, we've been at it for four years, you know, time to give up? You know, I, I think that thought always comes up, but the thing is that, like, there's so much to be learned. Like, there's so much that, that, you, can, that you can learn along the way. And I was also, I started meeting with a professional coach, executive coach, um, who's, who's a good mentor of mine now in 2015. So about a year after we started and he really helped me see just how much you can learn, even if you're not really progressing. And so that was another huge part of it was just the learnings that were able to come out of being in this situation where we were trying to start a company, we were trying to make something work and all the skills that we were able to learn around marketing and sales and building a product and producing content and all that kind of stuff, like dealing with customers, all those things that, that come along with it yes. were huge. Um, so 
you know, it, it definitely came up in, in thoughts, but at the same time, um, not not really, not in a serious way because okay, good. of, you know, just because of how much there was to learn along the way. So, yeah, um, yeah that puts us at 2017, the beginning of 2017. Mm. The end of, end of 2016 was just rough. Uh, we let go our, our last salesperson that we were trying to, to figure out how to sell the product and it just wasn't working. So we were back down to three people four years into the business. I, you know, kind of took a break for a little while in terms of, you know, really trying to do anything because just nothing I was doing for four years was working. It was just really mm. frustrating. Mm. Um, so then I came back beginning of 2017, hired uh, Jane, who runs our operations now, and asked her to just kind of take over everything in the day-to-day. And I cleared my mind to go back to that creative board space, you know, just like when I was a kid going outside and there was nothing to do Mm. is the same kind of thing. Like I'm now outside of the business kind of, there's nothing to do, but I have this like really strong desire to grow it. So then what do I do? Um, and I, I am employed some of the taxes that I used to take when I was a kid. I started reading a lot of books. I started talking to people. I started asking a lot of questions and kind of wandering around and stumbled upon this article written by somebody about Adidas and how Adidas has this insanely massive influencer program. They have like 50,000 influencers around the world who they give shoes to and they promote the shoes and that's how they make sales. It accounts for like 30, 30% of Adidas sales come from these influencers. And I was like, that's crazy. Um, so I was like, huh, I wonder if there's influencers who would talk about interact and, and our quiz tool, you know, it's an, it's an interesting concept. It's just not really something that people are aware of. So maybe that would work. So then the next day, uh, as I do going overboard, I came in and I emailed a hundred, a hundred influencers. Uh, and I did that every day for the next 30 days. Um, and we heard back from probably four or 500 of them. So out of a few thousand, four or 500 raised their hand. They're like, yeah, we're interested. We'll do a trade. Um, and the trade was, you know, we'll give you our software if you'll write about it. And it, it worked. Um, about a month and a half later, the first post about Interact went up on somebody else's blog. And that was that was the beginning of it. Now we've had almost 500 of those posts go up and we have 14, 1500 partners. And it has skyrocketed our growth. We've gone from the 200 paying customers up to 1100 in a year and a few months and change. And we've grown our team from three up to eight now. And our revenue has tripled and it's looking more and more like we're headed towards being a real big company um, that, that does really cool stuff. And is, is something that lasts for, for years to come. So it, uh, it really, really flipped quickly. Wow. Um, and that was, that was how it worked. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Just amazing. The journey that you guys have gone through and that you never gave up. Uh, for me, what you're saying there is never give up, just try different things. And, and the amazing thing was you took time out. You know, you went, walked away from the business, not literally, you were still part of the business, but walked away from the day to day, cleared your mind and started looking elsewhere. And that's when the answers came. And you then went, right, let's try this. If it works for them, it might work for me. And it did. Hugely inspirational, Josh. Well done. Awesome stuff. So what I'd like to do now, if, if that's okay with you, just tell us a little bit more about the product because I think people are super interested why you are now getting so many people signing up and using your product. 
um, what's the special thing about it and how can people leverage it? Yeah, so the product and what it looks like to people is a tool for creating quizzes. And there are quizzes like the ones that you see, you know, what kind of coffee drink are you? What kind of entrepreneur are you? That kind of stuff. But what it really is, is a way to start a conversation. And when we talk to our clients that are raving about their success with us, what they tell us is that they've had more productive conversations with new clients because of the quiz than they've ever had before. Mm. And what it does is it recreates the experience that you would get in a retail store or in any sort of business that actually cares about you as the client. Because what happens when you walk into a re retail store who cares about you as the client is they greet you cordially and then they start asking you questions. Yes. And those questions are about you and what you like, what you don't like, what kind of problems you have. Like, why are you in the store in the first place? What are you looking for? What, what, what problem are you looking to solve with the products that we may or may not have? And a good retail store employee knows how to ask the right questions to figure out who you are and what your needs are. And then they're able to offer up product suggestions. And maybe it's not product suggestions. Maybe it's just some sort of article you need to read or some sort of resource that you need or a book or whatever it is. And that is a great experience between a company and a customer. A quiz can recreate that experience right? because you can ask the right questions. You can set up a branching tree where if you answer one question one way, we, we show you a different question and we really start to understand who you are as the client before we start offering up suggestions of our products and our services. And that is what you can do with our tool. And that's why it's so interesting to people. And now I've had the opportunity to talk with many of the world's largest brands about this. And they're all extremely excited about the prospect of being able to converse with their clients mm. on a massive scale using a quiz like this, using this kind of conversational logic where you're actually able to give them what they want want because they're telling you what they want and that's what our product is and do the if you're answering questions on a certain you know is there intelligence behind the the so let's say if it's abc and i click c the next question i'll get is it going to be a different question compared to clicking on b for example yeah, so you can you set it up that way, and there's also a scoring system. So there's kind of two layers to the way the logic works. You can have like a tally going in the background, and you can also have different questions showing up right. depending on how you answer previous questions. So you can you can emulate a, a conversation where depending on the answer they give you initially, you're going to show them a, a different question after that. So that is how that's set up. And the prime purpose of people using this is to do, apart from having the conversation, I get that, but having a conversation doesn't make sales, right? It will help you on the journey towards a sale, potentially, but ultimately they need to make a sale. So how do they do that? Yeah, so there's really two primary ways that happens. One is that you can ask people for an email address within the quiz. And when they give you that email address, if you obtain their permission, you can also see which result they got on the quiz. So if you're doing a coffee quiz and they get the result of latte and they give you their email, you can see that their result was latte and you can send them coffee beans that are specific for making good lattes, or I guess yes. those would be espresso beans. And so you're able to start that conversation in a personalized way. Mm. So instead of just saying, here's all our coffee beans, go for it. Yeah. You're now saying, hey, no, we, we chose these espresso beans because of the profile that you got on the quiz. Yeah. And that's the number one way because 
you start talking to people like a human and not like some sort of robot that just responds to flyers you put up and all of a sudden their ears perk up and they're much more interested in speaking with you than if you're just sending them random stuff all the time. Mm. So that's the number one way. And then within the actual quiz, once they see their results, because they'll see them right on the screen, you can have buttons that link to your products and your services. You can say, you know, you got latte, click here to buy some awesome espresso beans to make your next latte. You can click there and then buy right away. So those are the two things is following up on that conversation using emails and then following up immediately with buttons to go check out further services or products. Yeah. And and so the inevitable question that comes through my head with everything that's been going on in the last couple of months, which is Cambridge Analytica, GDPR, um, how, how are you compliant in, you know, with Facebook and everything that's happened there, uh, you know, a lot of people's data were collected and then that data was given away and then stolen and then used for other reasons. I mean, how how's that affected your business, if at all? And how are you geared for making sure that this doesn't happen with you or your clients? Yeah, so there's, there's a few things. Um, First off, we are compliant. We uh, contacted and are now engaged with a second law firm specifically for GDPR. They're a GDPR specific law firm. And we went through the entire process. We spent most of this year to this point working only on GDPR. We dropped every other project we were doing, sacrificing all the potential revenue we could have gotten just to make sure we had all the compliance in place for GDPR. Now, specifically with Cambridge Analytica, I have an interesting backstory with them because I sat down with a CMO of a large company in 2014. And when I told them what we were doing, they told me about this company called Cambridge Analytica that was working for pro-Brexit. And I was like, that's really interesting government of the UK is using Interact to make a quiz. Now, comparing those two quizzes side by side, the government of the UK using Interact to make a quiz, their quiz was how much do you actually know about the EU? And it had seven questions asking whether you knew what it was. And at the end of the quiz, it said, maybe you should reconsider leaving the EU since you don't know what it is, something along those lines. Yeah. That quiz collected zero personal information. When you look at the analytics, you can see what percentage of people answered each question each way, what percentage of people actually know about the EU, but you have zero clue who those people are. Right. You have no way of ever getting back to them. On the other side of the equation, Cambridge Analytica, pro-Brexit, made a Facebook quiz that requires you to log in with Facebook mm. to take the quiz the second you log in with Facebook to take the quiz, Cambridge Analytica not only stole all of your personal data, they stole all of your friends' personal data. Yeah. And so Cambridge Analytica was able to steal all of the Facebook information of everybody in the UK from one quiz. They were able to use the dark web to tie that information back to specific email addresses and figure out exactly who was who and then create personalized Facebook advertising that targeted you based on who you were and turned you towards pro-Brexit. Now, those situations, while both starts with a quiz, are absolutely different. Yes. It is now illegal to require people to log in with Facebook in order to take a quiz. Interact has never had a feature, never had a feature, asking people to log in with Facebook to take right. a quiz. Great. If you put in information in an Interact quiz, it's because you physically typed it in. Yes. You typed in your email address, you typed in your name, and now with GDPR, you also checked a box that says, I consent to giving my information to the company that made this quiz, and if you don't want to, you can skip the form. That's how our product works. The way Cambridge Analytica works, they ask you to sign in with Facebook. 
They steal all your information. They steal all your friends' information. They use the dark web to figure out who you are, and then they target you with specific advertising. And that's why they no longer exist, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the entire thing is is data warfare, essentially. Mm. And there's no consent being given ever. Like, you sign in with stuff, you sign into stuff with Facebook. How are you supposed to know, like, that your information is now being given to Cambridge Analytica, who has nothing to do with the thing that you signed into the quiz with? Like, yeah. That's crazy. And <clears throat> small side note, everybody's information was given to Cambridge Analytica, all 1.5 billion users on Facebook. So just so you know, they have your information. They have my information. They have everyone's information. Mm. And it, it all started with, <laughs> it's funny because Zuckerberg tried to blame it on a quiz by putting the word quiz everywhere. Yes. It has nothing to do with a quiz. It has everything to do with the fact that Cambridge Analytica exploited a loophole in Facebook in yeah. order to get everyone's information. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And we don't know how many people are out there that have done the same at some stage and taken their app down, you know. Yep. So they might have had the app up for six months, collected all the data, shut it down and went, right, we've got all this data. Now we're going to target them with ads. So we have no idea how big the problem is. Cambridge Analytica might just literally be the tip of the iceberg. But I, I want to give you a virtual high five because brilliant news that you are compliant, that, that people do not need to sign in with any other method, that if they want the information that they're sharing, they're giving an email address and pe and then they'll get the confirmation or whatever they, they've put in. And, and you are engaging people like having a human kind of conversation via the internet with them. So mm. yeah, brilliant. Well, yeah, thank you. Anything, anything else we've missed Josh in that you want to get out and please also take it, take a few minutes to, confirm the website address, where they can find you, how they can get hold of you. What are the best places for people to do that? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh, to get a hold of me, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, you can search for Josh Hainum. There's only one of me in the world. I have a very unique last name. So um, it's H-A-Y-N-A-M, uh, and you will find me. Uh, the website is tryinteract.com, but I would recommend probably going to our blog first, tryinteract.com slash blog. That's where I write about how this works, and you can kind of see all those details before jumping into anything. Um, and just as like a sign-off type of thing, I think, like I said, the reason that I care about quizzes because like who cares they're dumb but the reason that i care is that it helps companies start conversations like mm -hmm. real conversations where you're actually talking with the people that might buy your product or service and you're humanizing those other people when you talk to them you realize who they are and what their struggles are it's it's easy to kind of be frustrated with a group of people or with an idea or whatever it's almost impossible to like be frustrated with the person that you're speaking to in person. And that principle is what we've built our entire business on. We talk with at least 15 clients a day across our business. You know, everybody that works here is on the phone all the time with clients. And that's how you grow a real company is by connecting with the people that are interested in what you do. And a quiz can be one way to help with that. There's other ways to get those conversations going. Whatever it is, if you're trying to start something or if you've already started something, all you should be doing, like literally at least half of your time, should be spent talking with your clients or your potential clients and not putting a cap on those conversations just as long as they need, as long as they want. That's how you build a business. There's there's no secrets to it. That's that's really it. Perfect. I I I think that sounds super interesting. And the other thing I'm just going to add to that as well, for me, because I'm a storyteller, everything is about people's story, right? We've just heard your story. And if people that are using these quizzes can get even a tiny bit of that person's story out, 
then once you know somebody's story, you have a much closer connection with them because you know what they've gone through, you know what it is that they're struggling with. And at the end of the day, all that you're trying to do, what I'm trying to do, what everybody's trying to do is solve people's problems, right? Their issues or their challenges. And so, yeah, I, I think it's perfect. Brilliant. Josh, thank you so much. And um, we've told them to go to the blog. I'll make sure I put all the links in the show notes as well. I really appreciate it. I don't know if you ever come to the UK, but if you do, please let me know. And if you're coming to London or whatever, I'm, I'm not in London, but I'll make sure to come down to London and we can have a coffee or lunch together. That will be really awesome. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much for being on the podcast and success with your renewed energy and your growing business. I love it. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 